Welcome everyone uh, to our third and final part of Women in the Early Church and um, what that tells us about women in the life of the church today uh, with uh, Dr. Jeannie Constantino. Um, she's given two wonderful talks so far um, uh, describing how women were treated in the time of Christ by, by the Jews um, and then the transformation that happened uh, with Christ and the, and the gospel and the church. Um, she spoke about um, last time, many of the women of the early church, those uh, who were co-workers with St. Paul and, and, and so many others, uh, disciples of the Lord and, and all that women were, were able to do. And we, we began tonight's topic a little bit last time, <laughs> touching on mm -hmm. some of the, the, the historical development of uh, women diaconate um, by talking about a bit about St. Phoebe last time, the only real um, woman deacon mentioned in scripture um, as, a, as a deacon. So we're going to pick up with uh, with all of that tonight and allow me just to to start our meeting tonight since we are I'm still in the midst of celebrating this great uh, um Feast, which is kind of like the Pascha of the summer, the Dermission of the mm -hmm. and translation of the Mother of God, uh, with the hymn uh, for the Dermission, and then um, we'll get started. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In giving birth, thou didst retain thy virginity, and in thy falling asleep, the world thou didst not forsake, O Theotokos. You were translated unto life, being yourself the mother of life. And by your intercessions, you deliver our souls from death. Lord, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for gathering us together again with Dr. Jeannie as we complete this talk on women in the early church and women in the church today. We ask that you be with us. You grant us understanding of your will for all the topics and the matters that we will discuss tonight and that we will do it in a way that serves the church, that serves um, all those uh, particularly involved and engaged in, the, in this ongoing discussion in the life of the church. For you are the way, the truth, and the light, and the life for us all. Through the intercessions, your most holy mother, have mercy upon us and save us. Amen. Okay, doctor. Amen. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that introduction uh, and beautiful prayer, Father. Yes, we're continuing our discussion about women in the early church um, this evening. And uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. I'm, I'm looking forward to our discussion tonight. Please feel free to be completely honest with your questions and your comments. And um, because it, it is an important topic, it's something that's actually been thrust upon us, whether we like it or not, and we need to be able to talk about it and, um, and uh, listen to everybody's opinions and reactions. So especially for those of you who just came from another meeting, thanks for coming and joining us tonight. So as Father mentioned, we were talking about last... Um, uh, last week, a little bit about women in the early church, and we did get a brief introduction into the female diaconate, but didn't talk about it too much. So I'm going to just review very briefly what we know historically about the female diaconate in the early church. And as Father Theodore mentioned, there is one woman who is mentioned in the New Testament as a deacon, and that is Phoebe. She's mentioned in Romans chapter 16, verse 1, and St. Paul says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, deaconess of the, or deacon of the church of Sencre. And so that epistle would have been written um, around maybe the year 58 or 59. So it's very early. It's, you know, about 25 years or so into the life of the church. And uh, we have this reference to this female deacon. Now, some people dispute that Phoebe was a deacon at all, uh, because the word is diakonos, 
And they sometimes translate that as a minister, um, because sometimes St. Paul will say, I am Barnabas and I are ministers of the gospel, and he will use that term. And um, it could also mean, you know, a servant, because that's what that's that is what that word meant also in Greek. So sometimes a service to the church or ministry is called, well, the Greek word for that would be diakonia. So um, because of that, some people have disputed whether or not Phoebe was actually a deacon at all. And the reason for this, this usually happens in um, Protestant circles. And the reason for that is because they don't want to acknowledge that women had any leadership role in the church at all. And this is sort of fueled from this idea that women are supposed to just be quiet and uh, they can't have any leadership and this kind of a thing. Um, they don't want to give any foothold to the idea that women could be ordained or serve as pastors and uh, priests or things like this. So this is the way that they try to say, no, 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 it shouldn't be interpreted this way. So it's really best, however, that we be accurate in our understanding of history, in our discussions, that we be truthful. That we just by acknowledging that Phoebe really was a deacon of the church doesn't mean necessarily that there should be women priests. So rather than deny the fact that she was a deacon, we should understand everything that was happening in its context. And we have to be honest. So um, I think that that is the motivation. But we also see similar things in the Catholic Church, for example. There are some Catholics who say she was not a deacon. Um, and they also deny that women were apostles in the church because they associate the role of an apostle with priesthood. We do not. So we don't have that problem. So how would we, as Orthodox Christians, resolve that question of whether or not Phoebe was an actual deacon as opposed to simply somebody who was helping with ministerial work in the church? It's very easy for us. We look at the tradition of the church. We look at what the... Uh, what the fathers of the church said about it. So on the one hand, Protestants, Protestants can say, well, she wasn't really a deacon at all because they don't look beyond the Bible. They don't look at the other early church documents. They don't bother with the church fathers. And so they're able to make that uh, dis decision based on nothing but their own particular opinion. But if we look at the tradition of the church, if we look at St. Saint, Saint John Chrysostom's comments, he doesn't have any problem with Phoebe being an actual deacon of the church. There were deacons in the church um, who served with St. John Chrysostom, and among them was his a very close friend of his, Olympia, who was a deacon of the church. The other thing we can look at is the fact that in the church um, collections of the saints, the Synexarion, in the listing of the saints of the church in the back of some of our, ser our service book called the Mineon, which lists all the, the saints of the day, or also the kind of unchanging parts of the service, she is listed as diakonos, diakonos, not diakonisa. Um, so it's the male title. It's the same way that a man would be described. She is described and as far as the early church is concerned, it's very clear that they regarded her as holding this position that we would consider an ordained position. That's what I'm getting at. So it's very, very important that we have these discussions based on actual history and not what we want it to be because we have this agenda that we are trying to, or a view of women that we're trying to sort of protect or, or deny as the case may be. So, now that we've acknowledged that she was an actual deacon of the church and that there were female deacons, we know this from other statements of other church fathers, from historical records, from service books that describe the ordination of a female deacon. We know that they did exist. So it's ridiculous to deny that they ever existed at all. But some people do. As a matter of fact, I've heard Orthodox Christians deny it too because they don't want women to be priests. Well, that's true. I mean, I don't want women to be priests either, but let's not um, deny the historical reality because then we lose all credibility 
completely. So uh, what was the function of female deacons? And I think that this is what we did talk about last time. It was primarily to assist with baptisms because people uh, were baptized completely naked and most people being coming for baptism were adults. So it would be considered not only for inappropriate for a male deacon or a priest or a bishop to see a woman completely naked, but part of the baptismal you know, ritual involves rubbing the body with oil. So perhaps you've served as a godparent, and there's a time when you stand over the baptismal font and you put your hands like this, in this uh, like in the shape of a cross, and they pour, the priest pours oil on your, in your, the little cup that your hand makes in your palm, and then you rub it all over the baby's body. Well, that would be a little bit, you know, inappropriate if she's a, a fully grown woman who's standing there naked. So because of that, uh, there were women deacons who assisted with baptisms. That was the most important function that they seem to have had, along with um, sort of keeping order in the women's section of the church. There was a section for women and children and also for taking Holy Communion to women who were, who were ill at home, uh, it again was something considered inappropriate for a man to go to a woman's home, especially if she was sick in bed. So that job was done by the female deacon. So where did they rank in terms of the order of the clergy? And this is a subject of great debate and discussion because there was inconsistency in the church. This is why people don't agree on the role of a female deacon. Um, there are two, we could say, sort of levels of clergy or people who perform functions within the church. The higher, what is often called the higher order of clergy are the bishops, the presbyters, and the deacons. And then in the lower ranks were people who were like subdeacons, um, readers, and chanters, and acolytes. And even there was an uh, or order of doorkeepers and other kind of various functions that people performed in the church, they would receive a blessing for that. So if you were among those lower groups and you received this blessing to have this, to serve this function in the church, you were tonsured by the bishop, prayers were read over you, that little bit of hair was cut off, that's what I mean by tonsured, and that took place outside of the sanctuary. On the other hand, and by the way, if you received that blessing and wanted to get married after that, you could. The higher orders of clergy were, um, were cases where the bishop blessed or consecrated this person for, for work in the church within the sanctuary, we would say today behind the Econostasis, and he did it by the laying on of hands and what we would call an ordination. And some service books describe the service of the ordaining of a deacon, of a female deacon on that level, that it was done inside the sanctuary, that she drank directly from the chalice, as the way a priest or deacon does today, when you see the priest receiving Holy Communion before he comes out with a chalice to offer to the people, he, was, he drinks from it directly. So does the bishop, so do other presbyters, so do deacons, but not the people that not the rest of us. So that's a mark of, of a higher order of clergy. So we see uh, women in the Orthodox Church, in the early church, also receiving that particular mm -hmm. blessing or ordination in the sanctuary by the bishop and drinking directly from the chalice. Now, also one of the ways they try to decide where exactly they fit in the order of, of either blessed uh, people who have been blessed for a certain service in the church or actually ordained, then that depends upon, sometimes they look at the prayers. How close is it? How similar is it to the male deacon's prayers? Um, what is the language that is used? What is implied by it? And this is the kind of thing that people who are experts in liturgics will analyze and they will reach a, um, a conclusion. The reason why there is disagreement in the church is because there was more than one way of ordaining or blessing a woman as a deacon. That's why there's disagreement. We simply, there was no uniformity of practice. 
the way we saw a kind of uniformity for male deacons or the uniformity for the um, ordination of a presbyter or a bishop. So that the reason why there's disagreement is because of that inconsistency. And um, this is this is why we don't see, we don't have agreement today about what it would mean if we were to restore the female diaconate, because we're not exactly clear about how it functioned in its entirety and its completeness in the ancient church. The other thing that we know about it is that there don't seem to have been deacons, women deacons, in the West. It seems to have been an Eastern thing. And as I mentioned, how they functioned or how they were set aside and blessed by the bishop for that function seems to have differed depending upon where you were in the Eastern part of the empire. Now, one thing we do know also is that they never were equivalent to a male deacon. They had different vestments than male deacons. They had a different function. They assisted with the care of, of women and children. They assisted with baptisms, but they never served liturgically. We know that they entered liturgically during the great entrance. Chrysostom describes the fact that there were 50 women deacons of the great church in Constantinople. But and that they entered during the procession along with everybody else. So he describes that. But that so that does, but that does not mean that they had a liturgical function the way a male deacon does to offer the petitions again and again in peace. Let us pray to the Lord. They weren't vested like a male deacon. So this shows that they did not perform the same function as a male deacon. And that's very significant. Because even though we may not be 100% certain about how they functioned in antiquity, and we know that there were, there were sort of different levels, um, some would be more akin to the lower order of clergy and some more like um, the higher orders. Nonetheless, they were never functioning in the same way that a male deacon was. That is absolutely clear from the prayers, from the vestments, and from what we know about in the liturgical life of the church. So the other thing we should note about female deacons, which was quite different from male deacons, is that they were older. And that is also significant in the canons of the church, because the canons do, again, this is an example of how we know that there were women deacons. They are mentioned in the canons of the church. The, the women deacons were expected to be older. Some canons say 60 years old, and another, and another canon says 40 years old. Either way, that was considered pretty old in antiquity, and it means that they were beyond their childbearing years, and that also is very significant. Their purpose was, or there was an expectation that a woman who was serving as a deacon, but they weren't necessarily unmarried, but many of them were nuns, or they were sort of living a consecrated life. So they tended to be unmarried, but it doesn't necessarily say that she has to be unmarried. But she would definitely, if she had been married, she'd be done taking care, not only bearing children, but she would no longer be taking care of her own family. So this is significant because the purpose of a, a woman deacon was expected to uh, be serving the church and not be neglecting her own family by doing so. And that's rather significant. So as I mentioned, they weren't universal. So why did the female diaconate die out? I think it's quite obvious. Why? Because their primary function was to help with adult baptisms of naked women. And after... Um, after the, the empire became Christianized and paganism died out by at least like the 5th century or certainly 6th century, almost everyone was a Christian. People were baptizing infants. And um, even, by the way, they had, did have infant baptism before. It's not that they suddenly decided on infant baptism, but it became the norm. So there was no more uh, need for uh, women deacons, and it just kind of died out. 
So now we would turn to the question of whether there would be any need for a female diaconate today, whether or not that would be useful in some way. I would say that I can see how it could be useful in some manner. I'm taking that position based on um, what I have seen and what I know, especially in the Greek parishes, which can be very large. And, um, and because, for example, when my husband was serving as a priest here in San Diego at the main church, then we had a huge church, which is, it covers a large geographical area. And there were about five or 600 families that were being served by the parish. And Father was the only priest. And he was visiting 100 different shut-ins every month. That's a lot of people to try to visit. He eventually got an assistant priest, but I could see how a female deacon, uh, since an ordinary lay person is not allowed to give communion, but a deacon can, how a female deacon could do hospital visits, say prayers and give communion, or visit shut-ins and th this kind of a thing. So I can see that. And we do have Orthodox women who are, uh, who visit, who are part of a prison ministry, who um, are who are social workers, who are um, hospital chaplains, but mm. they cannot give communion. So women like that, I could see giving her a blessing to be able to administer communion. So I could see it, but that does not mean that we should necessarily jump into this and ordain women as deacons today. So. What I try to do now is uh, I would like to give you the main arguments that are being made today. What I see as the primary arguments being made for the female diaconate. And if I missed one, Father Theodore, you can jump in and add anything you think I might have missed. Okay. So the first, um, the, f the first claim that is being made is that this is a restoration of what the church already has or already had. In other words, we're not, we're just bringing back something that we need today. This is the argument that there is, it is needed and that it is a restoration. Another argument that is made is that women are equal to men, which I would hope nobody denies. Some might, but nonetheless, that's pretty well accepted within the church. Another thing which we do hear often is that women needs, women need women's gifts that they need to be able to speak to other women. Uh, they need to have female clergy. And since there was at one time a female diaconate, this is something that would help meet the needs of women in the church. They could have a, a female clergy that they could talk to about their problems or whatever. Another term that I've heard, another statement I've heard is that the church is bleeding women. In other words, women are leaving the church because uh, there is nothing for them. There's no ministry open to them. They don't feel valued uh, by the church. It's time that the church kind of caught up with uh, what's happening modernly today. Women are occupying virtually and doing practically every job that there is to do today in every conceivable profession. And because there was at one time a female diaconate, there's really no reason why the church can't revive that. And the other thing is that we need a female diaconate because women today in the Orthodox Church do not have a voice, meaning they they have no, no authority, they're not empowered um, because they're not part of the clergy. And that this would encourage more women to participate in ministry. So those are the arguments, the main arguments, at least that I can think of. So let's talk about how we would respond to this. What, what are the arguments against the female diaconate? Let's start with the idea that this would just be a restoration of what the church already had. Well, that even if it is true that it is a restoration, first of all, we have to figure out exactly or make a decision what was the role of the woman deacon in the early church. We're not even clear on what that is. Were they part of that lower order of clergy, more like a reader or chanter? Today, who would be tonsured? Or were they part of that higher order of clergy? We don't even know. So before we go off 
ordaining women as deacons, we need to figure out what was the practice. In other words, this was something that would require a lot of study and it would require the church to come to a conclusion about what they think is the best uh, answer to that question. Before we move forward to restore something, we have to know what it looked like. So I think it's rather disingenuous since we don't agree on what the female diaconate was like, um, then it's pretty hard to argue for a restoration. Um, the other thing that I, I find very disingenuous, of, disingenuous about this argument is that we know that the argument of most women who want this is not that they want a restoration, and this is you know, being promoted by the St. Phoebe Center, um, is that they really don't want a restoration. They want a new kind of female diaconate. In that case, then, in my opinion, they should stop speaking about restoration because it's not a restoration. It would be an innovation because what they wanted is women to have a, have a new kind of diaconate in which they would function exactly as men, as male deacons. And they succeeded in pulling that off by uh, having a woman ordained uh, recently in Africa. We'll all be talking about that a little bit later. So, I can't argue and would not argue that other churches should not have female pastors. Somebody asked me once, well, what about my niece? She feel, feels really called to be a priest, but well, she's a Lutheran. Well, she's a Lutheran. She can be a priest. Go, go be a priest. I'm not arguing that women should not be priests or, or pastors, Episcopalian, Lutheran. Let them be whatever they want, because those churches have already changed dramatically from the time of the early church. So why not change this too? They've changed absolutely everything else. Those churches have not preserved the apostolic faith. So for them to allow women to be priests is no different than anything, any other changes that they have made. Do you understand my point? And I, I don't have an opinion about what they should do in their church. They're gonna make their own decisions. But what we ought to do in our church ought to be consistent with what it is to be an Orthodox Christian. Now, women today are being promoted, uh, or the idea of a female diaconate is being promoted with an eye to the priesthood. We have to be absolutely clear about that. And the Phoebe Center used to say that directly on their website, that really there's nothing wrong with women priests either, but let's just start with the diaconate. They have removed that from their website because they knew it was trouble and they wanted people to just to serve as deacons first. They wanted to cross that threshold first and um, see a lot of women deacons in the churches and then do exactly what happened in the 1970s in the Episcopal Church, which was to say, well, we just want women deacons. Then once they got that, they said, well, since we already have women deacons, why can't they be priests also? And then why not bishops? And all along in the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Communion, they denied that that would happen. And that is exactly what happened. And those of us who are old people like me, we remember that. And we know that's exactly what happened. And they are, the Phoebe Center is following that pattern. And in my mind, I'm not saying this for all women who favor the female diaconate. I'm not saying that all of them favor, favor female priests, but many do. And that is the ultimate goal. And it won't be the final goal either. So the goal really of this movement is the female priesthood. And that's what happened to mainstream Protestants. Um, and even though we have the benefit of seeing what happened in those churches, this is what I don't understand. We see the devastation of those churches. There was a, this idea that people would come flocking to the churches. The churches would grow, you know, and that has not happened. Instead, there has been a very precipitous decline of attendance, of involvement of women and men. And um, women's, uh, by the way, seminaries are closing right and left. Lutheran seminaries, and they're just, they don't seem to see the correlation between their absolute rejection of apostolic tradition and 
the fact that their seminaries are closing, their churches are closing because they're dwindling down, the congregations are dwindling down, and their seminaries, the ones that exist, are full of women. Men are not uh, going to these seminaries. And I asked one of my friends, who's a Catholic priest, I might have mentioned this last time, he's a Catholic priest, a former student of mine, but in charge of ecumenical dialogue for the county, for the for the Diocese of San Diego, he goes around visiting other churches, and talking to the pastors, and has met a lot of these women priests, and their churches are dwindling and declining, except for the Episcopalians, he told me, because they have a lot of money. But the Lutheran churches and other churches are closing. And he said that the women who, uh, I said, why aren't men going to their seminaries? He says, because they really require you to ascribe to this ultra-liberal, ultra-feminist agenda, and it's a big turnoff for men. That was his. So they're not attracting men to the priesthood anymore. So I'm not surprised by that, but that was that was what he said. So um, the other argument, let's talk about another argument, that women are equal to men. Yes, of course, women are equal to men in the church. And this is what St. Paul said, that there is neither male nor female. And what this means is that, this is something we discussed on the first um, the, during the first session, that there is no difference in the way women pray to God, in the way that women are saved, in the what the church expects of women versus men. There's no difference. There is in Judaism. There are legal obligations for men, but not for women. Men can be rabbis and, and women cannot. Men are supposed to say certain prayers and women cannot. Men count for the purpose of a quorum. Women don't count. Women have other obligations under the law of Moses that men don't have, and all sorts of things. That does not exist in the Christian church. That's why St. Paul said there is neither male nor female in the church. So this, however, does not mean that, um, that women are the same as men, that they're identical to men, or that they can serve exactly in the same capacity as men. The church doesn't discriminate, however, between lay men and lay women. If you look at the church, a given, given parish like the one that you have there, father is the priest. Father, do you have a male deacon in your parish? We do. Okay. Do you have another priest? We have two. Okay. So you have two priests. Do you have any deacons? We have two priests and a deacon. Okay. So you have male clergy. So you have, if you count if you count me, there's three really. But uh, okay. uh, my so pro have, my predecessor is still attached to the church, okay. and we have a deacon who has a lay profession. Yeah. Okay, so you have um, how many people would you say your parish serves? How many families are part of our community? Okay, um, families. That's how we counted yeah. the or Greeks among the yeah, Greeks. We say yeah. families. I'd say we're around three hundred families. Okay, right that's now. a lot of people. Three hundred families, not three hundred people. But 300 no. families, so hundreds yeah. of people belong to this parish, and only maybe five of them are clergy. So what about all the men in the parish? Are they not equal to the, the men who are serving? They don't have the same function, but are we saying that the lay men are on a higher level than the lay women, and that in order to equalize them, we have to make women into deacons? The fact is that a lay woman can do anything that a lay man can do in the church. So lay men participate in theology, they're theologians and they're iconographers and they're chanters and readers and preachers and youth ministers and parish administrators and parish council members and everything else. Those roles are not forbidden to women either. So it's important to say and to note that uh, equality does not mean sameness, but women are not deprived of the opportunity to serve the church, either in, in any capacity, except in that very limited capacity, which is through an ordination. So let's talk about whether or not that is something that is it ought to be considered, because what, one of the big arguments is that women need women's gifts. Well, first of all, I don't think that there is such a thing as a woman's gift. There is no special charism of women. There is no special something that an ordained woman can offer 
to anyone, either a man or a woman, that, that a male deacon doesn't have, that a priest doesn't have. There's nothing special. There's no grace that is unique to women. And that's actually almost a Jewish notion that this gender has this and this gender lacks it. Or maybe she doesn't have it unless we give her, uh, you know, an ordination, an ord ordained position. So, you know, there's no special insight, some special grace, some something special that women have that men don't have. So if they mean that women want to speak to another woman, that's that I completely understand. And and a lot of women have come to me over the years as presbyteras. That's often a role the presbyteras serve, by the way, in the parish, to talk to us about something that there's this kind of personal. They feel a little reluctant to talk to father about it. I talk to them about it, and then I encourage them to talk to father about it. And after, with my assurance, they do. So this is not. This is really not something that requires um, a female deacon, because even though we understand that women might feel more comfortable speaking to another woman, what does this have to do with the diaconate? That is the question. Or dating a woman to the diaconate doesn't give her some special skills for counseling women or teaching theology or, or, um, or guiding her spiritually. Deacons do not perform that function. If a woman has a spiritual problem in the parish, we have a male deacon at the parish that, you know, that I attend. So nobody goes to the deacon when they have a spiritual question or need confession or to counseling, except that he happens to be a marriage and family therapist. They might in his capacity as a marriage and family therapist, but not because he's a deacon. So giving the women the diaconate does not really solve this question or problem that they perceive exists that women want to speak to another woman, even though, you know, sometimes they do and for certain sensitive issues. So a female deacon would not be trained and necessarily in anything that might be uh, of assistance. The, the deacon will always would be, have to send them to the priest anyhow, especially if it's something that requires a confession a female deacon would have to send them to a therapist or a counselor or a social worker or what, a psychologist, whatever it is. So that's not going to be solved by this idea that women need a, a deacon to speak to because she can answer maybe something simple. So can presbytera. Okay. <laughs> so can, and I wasn't, didn't have to, you don't have to be a theologian to speak to somebody and have a sympathetic ear. And by the way, we have other women who can do that in the parish. And that that is something that could be designated, you know, in the in a parish, a, a woman who might be someone that other women can talk to without the necessity of making her giving her an ordained position. So becoming a deacon does not equip a man to do ministry. They don't get special insight, special skills, because today deacons primarily serve liturgically. Father mentioned that there's a deacon with a lay profession, so is the deacon. At, at Saint Spirit on in San Diego, he's he serves as a marriage and family therapist. He has a full time job. He comes to church on Sundays primarily, or perhaps special days, but mostly he can't come to church for anything else. So he's not there to to serve in a capacity other than liturgically. And he's a, deacons are a tremendous help to the priests. Um, so we appreciate them for sure. But his ordination did not give him the skills to, to minister psychologically to women. That was his training as a, as a marriage and family therapist. So it is a very false claim to suggest that women deacons, having female deacons will automatically give women in the parish a place to go or a resource or someone to talk to for spiritual advice or psychological advice or support or guidance. So, um, the other thing that I, I, I disagree with strongly about this idea that women need women's gifts, besides the fact that being a deacon doesn't help, that there is no such thing as women's gifts, is the idea that this means that for all these centuries, women were neglected by the church. Their needs were not being met by the church. The, the priests are not capable of, of counseling or taking care of the women in the parish. Um, so I, I would disagree with that. And so... The fact is that the female diaconate died out for a reason. 
The reason for the female diaconate uh, no longer exists. The people aren't being baptized, adults are not being baptized naked. And if there was a need for it, the church would recognize that. And over time, the, a discussion would ensue. And they would say, maybe we need to start thinking about reviving the female diaconate. It would be discussed for many years. And then eventually it would happen in the natural course of having first recognized that need. But the fact is the Orthodox women, you can, you can disagree with me in the discussion period, if you wish, Orthodox women don't feel that their needs are not being met by the church. Even though perhaps there might be a time when we might prefer to speak to a woman. We don't upend the whole church to accomplish that so that just because occasionally we want to talk to a woman and not a man, that's, that's not a reason. It's not a sufficient reason. Now, as a matter of fact, we could argue that, that today, rather than having a greater need for a female diaconate, because women are engaged in virtually every profession that, that there is, except for the priesthood, we could argue that there's less of a need for a female diaconate because we have women psychologists and counselors and social workers and chaplains and all these other things. So we don't, we don't really need a woman. What is, what function is a female deacon going to serve in the church other than liturgically, which we know is something they never ever did before. So um, we have, by the way, in Greece, the, the most of the theologians are women, not men. We have, of course, but all over in, in Russia, in Serbia, and all the Orthodox countries here in America, we have women catechists and teachers, and as I mentioned, par parish administrators and parish council members and youth directors and Sunday school directors and choir directors and chanters. It was not like that when I was growing up. There were no women chanters. There were no women parish council members when I was a kid. This is something that only really started happening and it, when I was a teenager, we started to see this, but I had a lot of opposition to standing at the chanting stand when I was younger, when I was first married. That doesn't exist anymore. Um, so that women are not excluded from anything uh, anymore, except ordination. So there's nothing that women are prevented from doing. If they want to minister to the church, all of these ministries exist. Now, most of the work of the priest does not take place on Sunday morning. And this is what I think most people do not understand unless they've been part of a clergy family. The priest is in church on Sunday morning, but not unless there's a service, a, a feast or something like this, they, they're not in church most of the time. Most of the work of the priest is in the office where there's paperwork to be done, and people come to be to talk to him about whatever problems they have or to go out and make visits to people. This is the work of, of the priest to bless homes and, and you know, businesses and, and connect with people. That's the work of the priest. It doesn't happen primarily in worship, but that's what people see. And that's why they want to see women there, because they think that this is what makes uh, a woman, what will give women some value or importance in the church. Because when we come to church, we see the priest and the deacon, the priests and the deacon, and there they are in front of everybody, and they look very important. It look, looks like what they're doing is important, and what we're doing is not important, because we're just chanting or singing or standing in the pew and praying. So, there's this idea that in order to have some kind of important role in the church, you have to be functioning liturgically. And of course, I would disagree with that. And, um, but this, uh, there's a sense that men are valued or important because they are serving in liturgically and, and women are not. The other thing that we, we see is the women saying that women don't have a voice. You know, women are are needed to have this role because they have no authority in the church, they have no influence, they have no power, and they see the priesthood as a position of power. And any priest will tell you <laughs> is that, yes, we kiss the priest's hand and we call him father, but they get a lot of kicks 
behind the scenes. Sometimes <laughs> the priest is the worst treated person in the parish. I'm not going to put Father on the spot to confirm or deny that, but it's the truth. The priesthood in the Orthodox Church is a life of sacrifice, not a life of, of great um, power, because priests don't really hold power in the church. And again, this notion that priesthood is equated with power comes from the West. It comes from the Catholic Church, which does not allow lay involvement. Now they have more lay involvement. But historically, everything was done by the priests and the bishops. Everything came from the Pope down. And there was this idea that priesthood is associated with power. And you couldn't rise up in the church. You couldn't do very much in the church without being a man, because only as a man, only men could be priests. So, so this is a big misconception that we have. We really need to change our idea of what it means to be a priest, because believe me, the 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 priests, there's a reason why our priests don't live very long. And that's the truth. There's a reason why a lot of our priests are overweight and a lot of them are diabetics. And that's because of the stress. It is not a position you take because you can give orders and tell everybody else what to do. The priests, in, especially in America, they don't have that. They don't, people don't just salute and say, yes, Father, whatever you say, Father. <laughs> Whatever the priest does, Father's laughing because it's true. Whatever the priest does in a parish, he has to convince the parish council. He doesn't even have a vote on the parish council. He has to deal with people who have different opinions. They're arguing, and he has to find a way to bring peace and harmony and consensus through diplomacy alone. He doesn't have a magic wand, and he can't order anything in the church Except that has whatever has to do exactly with the services. That's his department. But people have opinions about that too. And they criticize criticize him for that too. Why does Father read this prayer? Why does he stand there and not stand there? Why does he do this? Why doesn't he allow this? The priest does not operate from a position of power and authority like a dictator. And the sooner we recognize that women are not going to get authority in the church simply by becoming deacons, we'll be much better off. So Unfortunately, when we talk about whether or not the church should change, I, I, I'm very disappointed. I, I was willing to accept that possibly there might be some usefulness to having women deacons in a very limited role in the church in big parishes where a priest is alone, like mine was with a parish of five or 600 families. I could see it if the woman was worthy, if she were older, if she were, you know, had, had the ability to serve the church and just to give her the ability to uh, give Holy Communion, I could see that. But what I see happening today is a movement that I think is based on lies, uh, on the false pretenses. And the first and most important false pretenses is that this is a restoration. It is not a restoration. It is an innovation that will only cause harm, not good, because it is not going to result in what they say it is for. The purpose is, is to better minister to women, but there won't be any better ministry toward women by making a woman a deacon because making her a deacon does not give her the skills to either be a spiritual guide and she's not supposed to be a spiritual guide, just as a deacon isn't, not gonna give her the skills to, to be able to counsel women or anything else. So it won't fulfill the purpose for which they say that they want it. Um, so that's a false pretense, a false premise. It is a sham um, because it is also, we know what the real goal is, maybe not for all women who favor the female diaconate, but for many of them, the real goal is a female priesthood. And the woman who was ordained in Africa on Holy Thursday was too young to be ordained, canonically too young. And there's a reason why there were, women were older. And she, by the way, if they were going to try to, to, um, to have a female become a deacon, at least let her have the qualifications that they say that they want. She's not a counselor. She's not a psychologist. She's not a theologian. She's a scientist. She's a climate scientist. And so how is that? How is she somebody who women are going to come to because they want to speak to a woman, unless they're afraid of global warming or something like that? How does that serve what they say the female diaconate is supposed to achieve. 
obviously it's not, she has no experience in ministry, chaplaincy or anything else. So, you know, what is, why would women go to her? Just because she's ordained doesn't make her qualified. And I think it's, it's a pro it's a problem if you're sending women to be counseled by women who are not qualified to answer theological questions from women who are not theologians, to give spiritual guidance for women who are not capable of being spiritual guides. So what happens, I might ask, since this woman, since we're on that subject, this woman who is young and married gets pregnant. Are we going to have a woman who is seven, eight, nine months pregnant, standing in front of the congregation, saying again, again, in peace, let us pray the Lord? I mean, is there something wrong with pregnancy? I'm sure I'll be attacked for saying that. Of course not. But is that appropriate? Is this something which would ever have been seen in the early church? Of course not. It's almost scandalous. Okay, it's almost scandalous. So this idea that women need to be empowered by the church is this idea that power comes to men because men are clergy and power, we want power to change the church. And we're going to begin with having women deacons and to try to influence the church. Now, women deacons will not give them any authority or any voice that they will recognize. And here's why. Because deacons assist the priest. A deacon to do can do nothing by himself. In the Catholic Church, they do. The Catholic deacons can baptize babies and they can marry people, but not in the Orthodox Church. A deacon is an assistant to the priest. A deacon cannot have the divine liturgy or anything else by himself. De so deaconesses will not be empowered. And so what's going to happen is after, let's assume that we have a whole lot of female deacons ordained in the Orthodox Church. Then the women who were promoting the female diaconate will say, but they're not empowered. They're not being treated as equals. They're not being allowed to become priests. And men are still entrusted with the care of souls. Men are the ones who, who read the prayers of, of absolution and confession. Women need to confess to another woman. Women are being deprived of a voice. Um, they're limited to being lowly deacons and all the powers up here in the priesthood. That's the argument that they will make. So let's assume, I don't think this is going to happen, but let's assume that Orthodox women or Orthodox people become accustomed to seeing female deacons and they get persuaded that, oh yes, uh, we need to have women priests. And now we have a lot of women priests in the Orthodox church. Let's say that happens. Will that solve the problem of women not having a voice? Well, let me ask you, as I mentioned, not only is the priest the, often the worst treated person in the parish, you have to take my word on this, because the priests do not complain. You have no idea what the priests go through in the parish. They get a clotzi, you know, uh, from all sides. The, is the priest a person of power in the parish? Well, they would find out that he is not, because the priest can do nothing without the bishop. I want you to understand this the whole idea of having women have a voice and authority and power in the parish or in the church has nothing to do with the diaconate. And it won't be resolved by the diaconate because priests don't have that either. Priests can do nothing without the bishop. The priest is the representative of the bishop in your parish. He can't do a divine liturgy without the permission of the bishop. He can't go on vacation without the permission of the bishop. You probably didn't know that. He cannot... Go, he cannot travel to another diocese and do a service without the permission of that bishop. He cannot change the canons of the church to, to uh, relax the canon without involving the bishop. The priest has zero authority in the parish. That's the truth. Everything resides with the bishop. And by the way, he can't do a sacrament. Why do you think you fill out those forms, those forms before you have a wedding or a baptism? Where do those forms go? They go to the diocese. They go to the metropolis because it has to have the permission of the bishop to do a sacrament in the church. So priests don't just operate willy-nilly because they have all this power and the bishop is just this kind of figurehead. So what will that mean? Let's assume that there's a whole bunch of Orthodox women. What will they say? The women who become Orthodox priests, what will they say? Ah, oh, the real power is in the episcopacy. We don't have a voice because we are not bishops. We're being excluded. 
So then they will want to be bishops. Can you see my point? This will never end. Now, let's imagine that there are Orthodox women bishops, as hard as that is to imagine. Just follow along with the scenario for me. What will they say? Oh, I can't do everything I want as a bishop. Bishops have to follow the canons and the rubrics of the church. Bishops have to are answerable to other bishops. They meet in councils together and synods together. They can't do whatever they want. So what I'm trying to show you is that what is really behind this is a desire to change the church. But no one can do that in the church. Nobody has the authority to do whatever they want. Orthodoxy is not a free-for-all where we decide what we want and follow our desires. And our, because and, and the, the ultimate power is nowhere in the church because the power and authority in the church resides among everyone. Even bishops, although they have the greatest amount of authority, are not alone. So this idea that women need the diaconate to have a voice in the church is false because that will not satisfy them. They will insist on the priesthood and they're going to throw everything into confusion and discord because people will say, well, we have women deacons. Why not make them priests? And then that will not satisfy them. That's exactly what happened in the Anglican communion and in the Episcopal church. They said, we're only going to make women deacons. And then after a few years, well, okay, we'll make them priests, but never bishops. And of course, that's exactly what they have today. They have female bishops. And I will tell you something else. Where there is um, that kind of a violation of the apostolic tradition, heresy always follows. This change will not end there. It always results in heresy. That's the truth. So that's exactly why the Episcopal Church has gone off the deep end. Because once you introduce a significant change like that, then it opens up the floodgates to, well, why, we've changed this. Why can't we change this? And then why not this? And why not this? And why not this? Because, um, the, the, especially for the Orthodox, there's, there's no question about that because it would change the entire character of the church. So, you know, women have a voice in the church right now. They do practically everything there is to do in the church. So female deacons would change the character of the church because orthodoxy fundamentally does not change. When we say that, we don't mean it's never changed, but it changes very slowly, very organically if a change is necessary, not because one person says, I think it needs to change and I'm going to make that change happen. And that's exactly what happened with that ordination in Africa on Holy Thursday. A small group said, we don't care what you want. We, we're tired of waiting. They, we've only been discussing this for a few years. We're tired of waiting. This is going to happen whether you like it or not. And they pushed it through and they got this woman. I feel sorry for her because I think she's a pawn in all of this. They got her ordained. This is not how we do things in the Orthodox Church. And if we begin to do th things this way, we'll no longer have a church. That's exactly what's going to happen. It sets a precedent for change. So if we make this change, why not change something else? Let's say I don't like Byzantine chant. I like rock and roll. Well, why can't I just decide as, let's say I'm, let's say I'm a man, as a priest, from now on, we're gonna have a four piece rock and roll band in the church. Well, why not? I mean, that's less of a drastic change if you ask me than making a woman into a deacon or a priest, which is, is what they want. So the, the point is, this is exactly what has happened in the Catholic Church. I mean, when are we going to wake up? Because we see what happened in the Protestant churches with making women priests and deacons and priests and bishops. And in the Catholic Church, because they inaugurated changes, once you open a crack in the wall, it opens a Pandora's box or a flood begins. The wall, the dam bursts. And you have all kinds of changes in the Catholic Church that were completely unanticipated when they decided to modernize in the 1960s. They are a mess. There's a lot of um, division and fracture and arguments and problems in the Catholic Church that they never had before they decided to change a few things. 
And once you open up the possibility of change, it leads to more change and more change and more change. Now, what about this idea that women are, are leaving the church? I don't see women leaving the Orthodox church. Definitely more men are joining the church, but I don't see women leaving the church. I haven't experienced that. And I don't think that that's happening, but I can tell you that men and women will leave the church. The church will be, the churches will be empty if they, you know, decide to do this. So female diaconate will con create confusion because what is it that we that makes us orthodox? The push for female de deacons follows the thinking of this world that people are valued because they have a position, because they have a title, because they're ordained. But in the church, we're not supposed to seek recognition and authority and power. And, and, and instead, what we what we are have been given in this one particular ordination was uh, um, this idea that that we're going to do it whether you like it or not, and it was an assault on the church. It was an assault on orthodoxy, on the life of the church. It was an assault on the bishops. It was done stealthily during Holy Week when people would not be paying attention. It was done secretly. Nobody knew about it except the the Phoebe Center knew about it. They went there and they took pictures. And they knew all about it. And that's very disingenuous. This is not the way we do things in the Orthodox Church. We cram something, a change down the throats of the people. This, this is not what we do because this shows no humility, no patience. It shows arrogance. It shows a lack of respect for the tradition of the church, for the love and the peace and the harmony in the church. So this is why that was certainly not a victory. It was a disaster. And... Um, People justified on the basis that this was a response to the needs of the Church of Africa. Well, I don't think that they're baptizing uh, adult women naked in Africa. And if they wanted to serve the needs of the church and really were going to restore the diaconate, they should have restored what it was. And instead, this particular woman was vested in the same exact vestments as a male deacon and given the same liturgical role as a male deacon. And that was a violation of the of the sanctity of orthodox tradition and the way we do things in the church which is to preserve the tradition of the church so what is to prevent this group from finding a, a, a bishop who will ordain a woman a, a priest because there's nothing to prevent them from doing this this is just a recipe for schism and that is exactly what's going to happen if this doesn't end you know with this so i will end with this comment what makes us orthodox? What makes orthodoxy what it is? We are orthodox, and what makes us orthodox is that we preserve the traditions of the church. As soon as we start to change that, and this is not a preservation, but an innovation, as soon as we start to change that, then we lose the church completely because we open the door to all kinds of of changes and become exactly like the Protestants. That is what will happen. Thousand different kinds of orthodoxy that will not be in communion with each other. That's what's gonna happen. The Catholics have those made those changes, but they are united under the Pope. We don't have a Pope. So there is nothing that unites the Orthodox except their devotion to holy tradition. So if we give that up, then we will have nothing and we will just dissolve into thousands of different factions like the Protestants. So with that, I'm going to stop talking and I don't know, Father, if you want to have a break or you want to open the floor up. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Jamie. And, uh, Keep talking, I'm listening. Okay. <laughs> and um, I, I knew that you would not hold back and, and you didn't. And uh, we appreciate your, your fervor your your zeal. I think there may be some questions, just in clarification. Questions or comments. And I, as I, yeah. I mentioned when I said, you please, you feel free to disagree with me if you think I'm wrong. We're here to discuss this. It's, it is an important topic. So please go ahead. I'll try to keep my answers brief. I, I see we already have one hand raised. Go ahead. So let's go ahead, let's go ahead with the questions and I'll, I'll raise my points if need be. Go ahead, Maria. Hello. Welcome. Uh, hello. Uh, 
Well, Dr. Jeannie, first of all, I have great respect for you. I'm totally shocked the way you speak. So thank you for helping me <laughs> see everything in a different light because I've really been brainwashed by my very good friends. Oh. Uh, and um, thank you for enlightening me. But really, uh, Father Theodore, why do you look so happy all these years that I know you if, it, in fact, it's described like Dr. Jeannie says? I mean, like, wow, is this the <laughs> work of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God, because you're totally yes. happy according to how uh, uh, Dr. Yeah, Jean yeah. describes it. I, I remember one gathering we had of uh, clergy with Archbishop Demetrius. It was, uh, yeah. I think it was a clergy lady congress that was being held at the seminary in Boston. And it was over lunch and the Archbishop told us, the priest has the best job in the world. And <laughs> and his, his, his reasoning for that is that um, the priest gets to do what um, what what we're we're all called to do in a way, and, and that is to serve, to give so our life right. in service that's to right. others. So right. I, I you know I I, I appreciate Dr. Jeannie's uh, description of of the difficulties, but I was smiling during that because although not, it's not only true, in a way, I've I've come to learn in my own priesthood that those struggles. And how I respond to them yes. are yes. are often enable me to receive yes. the grace that I need to be able to serve That's others. That's right. You know, it's like so, Saint so Paul. the two the two very That's much right. go go hand in hand. That's right. And and That's that right. is that is you know the 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 authority that a priest has is precisely the authority of love, right? The authority to serve. Right. And when exactly when right. people come to understand that he loves his flock and he cares for his flock. Then, then they follow. Then, then they're right. willing, willing to to listen. And I think we can make some, even some comparisons to the um, uh, the the role of husband and wife within a marriage. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, when when the husband fulfills what he is called to do by the Lord to lay down his life for his wife and to love love her as Christ loved the church, it enables the woman to to show that. Um, deference, that respect, um, not competing with him, but but um, you know, it, it, I was just I was reading a uh, reading something from um, uh, Saint Gavrilia before Yerondisha Gavrilia, and, and she was talking about her counseling of 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 women and and how difficult she finds it to counsel women today um, in uh, in in their marriages. Now, now, this was like 20 years ago when she was writing this. So you can just imagine today. She yeah, said course, yeah. she, she was she was showing how it was easier for husbands to love their wives when they when wife really needed him more, you know, and, and appreciate and to cherish his cherish his, his wife, the mother of his children, the one who 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 cared for him. And, and some of her counsel would be don't talk so much to your husband, you know, don't don't don't. Don't talk against him so much, and and there's there's a hidden wisdom in in, in yes. all of this, and it doesn't it doesn't say that there's an inequality in inequality within marriage, but rather there there is this um, complementary relationship uh, where each serves the other, each each offers himself to, to the other in in the roles in that in which it glorifies God and. Somehow, I think that really is tied. We really haven't gotten into a the theological discussion about why the male priesthood at all. And maybe that's not the appropriate discussion for tonight. Maybe we can do that in the future. I'll stop here because we have some other hands yeah. raised. You know, Amelia, I, I just you, want you, to say that the priesthood, the priesthood is a kind of martyrdom. That was my point. And we know that the martyrs went to their deaths cheerfully because they loved Christ. So you're very blessed that you have a cheerful priest who has used his the insults that he has experienced. And, and I don't even know Father well enough to know what he's been through. I don't know his life. I just know that it happens to every priest. Whatever the put downs, the insults, the difficulties, the challenges, whatever he's been through, he's used that for his spiritual improvement. But not all priests do because some of them become bitter and some of them become burnt out. And that, that's the truth. Yeah, but it's Father a martyrdom. Tomitopka. I just want you to understand that it's not a position of power, but a position of martyrdom. It, it is, it is, Doctor. And but it's also, 
that is, in a sense, our Christian calling, right? That's to, right. To give witness. That's right. To Christ, uh, of Father course, Thomas, of course. I would would actually say the priest that complains of burnout should be sued for malpractice. Because <laughs> if we're doing our job correctly, we're using all the tools that the church gives us. Yeah. That that's and enables us he it, for his grace to work yes, with us yes, more fully. Yes. You know, it's his priesthood, not ours. Um, but Maria, thank you so much for those comments. Thank you, and, Maria. Yeah, and I was a bit, you know, breaking the tenth commandment when I met Bishop uh, Christina from, uh, you know, Sweden, and she's, you know, Lutheran bishop. So this is very, as a Hellenic college student, you know, and as a female, I thought it was a historic moment that there was a first uh, female deaconess. But sorry, I, I'm really seeing things in a different light now. Thank you. Thank you. So the, I, the second person I saw who raised her hand was Amelia Sherman. Amelia, thank you for joining us again. And thank you for letting us uh, see your beautiful face. What's your question? Thanks. Um, so I did want to say that sometimes when I've read the gospel or certain homilies in the prologue, um, I do feel like sometimes women are... Um, I don't really even know how to how to put it, but maybe even rejected from positions of power instead of just um, this isn't your place to be in a position of power. It's um, this is a really bad thing if you are in a position of power. Like there was one homily I read um, from the prologue that said, you know, use the that verse from the gospel that um you know children and women will be their rulers and um the women will be in charge of them as a curse over the people mm. and i was just wondering why that was yeah. such a bad thing i think that we have to recognize question. yeah we we should thank you for that thing that we have to recognize that there has been a certain level of misogyny in the church I, I'm not talking about that today, but that has existed. And this idea, especially about women, sort of some people, women complain that, you know, they read in the Gospels that, that uh, or not in the Gospels, but in, among the fathers, that women are a source of temptation and things like this. Well, we have to remember that, that um, women did not have the kind of education that they have today. So they were ill-equipped. They couldn't take care of. They, could, they didn't run businesses, they didn't, uh, they weren't in public office and things like that. So that was the way of saying that you're gonna, you're gonna not, you're gonna have an incompetent person. Okay, so I don't know this so much about her being a woman, that there's something inherently wrong with that as of her as a woman. And when people will, will talk about monastic writings where they talk about women as a source of temptation, that's because they're written by monks for monks. And so, yes. Women are a source of temptation for monks. Again, we have to look at what we are allowed to do in the church as lay women. What are the parameters the church gives us? Until recently, we didn't do a lot in the church except for philopterous. Okay? And that's because we didn't have the ability to do that because we didn't have the time. We didn't have the education. So we couldn't have expected my grandmother, my grandma's not going to go out and become a theologian or something. You know, you have to understand, we have today the opportunity to be very involved in a lot of leadership positions in the church, and the church does not forbid it. So um, even though in the past this was something unusual and didn't happen, not that it was impossible because in the past we did have women theologians and hymnographers and all kinds of other things. So it's not that it's impossible, but it was not common because women were getting married and they had everything they could, they had full just to raise their kids and keep a house. And even, you know, our, our own mothers who didn't have disposable diapers, didn't have frozen dinners and things like this. It, it was a full-time job just to be a wife and mom. So they didn't have that opportunity. And women got married right out of high school if they finished even high school. See what I'm trying to say? So there's nothing to prevent a woman from being involved. And I don't think we should take those comments by people who lived back then very seriously. Okay? We should look at the life of the church 
We have lots of women who are examples of having active ministry in the church. Back to the first century, we should do whatever the church allows us to do, which is everything except be a deacon, priest, or bishop. So don't be disheartened by that. That's what I'm trying to say to you. Uh, I mean, Ignore that. A, That's what I would say. To, and just to add to Dr. Constantinus' comments, um, the, so the prologue of Ocrid, that's what you're referring to, right? Written by St. Nikolai Vilimirovich. So although St. Nikolai was a saint who lived very much in our own times, you know, a saint who, and here in America, one of the, the saints who served in, in America, um, I'm, I, I don't recall that particular passage, but it sounds like it, it was quoting something from the Old Testament. And that, and, mm -hmm. and before I oh, yeah, that's true, Father. Say, say too much, you know, if if we go back to Dr. Constantino's first presentation, we'll understand perhaps where that's coming from. And maybe what the saint was trying to do is to read into that, to find a way to apply that somehow to our circumstance today without holding on to necessarily those um, prejudices that were being expressed. Right. Um, you, you know, we, we have to be very careful that we not allow ourselves to become easily scandalized. Because the one who wants to scandalize us and say, oh, the Orthodox Church, they don't care about women. They don't respect women. Uh, that's the devil. He wants us to leave the church. So we have to be careful. If we read something and it sort of disturbs you, then you've got a wonderful priest here. Ask him about it. Father, I don't understand why did this person who's a saint also remember that saints have their own limitations and saints are not perfect. Fathers of the church made mistakes and they said things that also that were wrong. They're, they're not infallible. So we have to understand them as men of their times and look instead to what the tradition has, the roles of, that the church has allowed women to do and just follow that and not get too upset about these kinds of things or leave the church in a huff. You see what I mean? Thank you, Doctor. So Stevie, why don't you ask your question? Oh, Stevie, you you're still you're still muted. You're muted. You are muted. Sorry about that. No problem. I was just saying thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Jeannie. Thank you. I was so shocked when you said, I forget the exact words, but something to the effect of women don't have a specific gift. And yeah. uh, you were talking about um, that would help them to serve in the church and the um, grace that comes with serving. The reason it shocked me is because I'm so used to hearing on both sides of the aisle, as it were, that women have unique gifts. And it probably is meant in a different way in those contexts than Maybe. what you were yeah. saying. But I was just wondering if you could elaborate more on what you meant. I was shocked in kind of a good way, I should add. Like, yeah. it was yeah, a yeah. word, and you I, could just say more. Look, I think that sometimes people talk about this. Well, look, as women, we understand each other in a way that a man doesn't. For example, I have to tell you that lately I'm talking a lot, uh, as much as I can, to priests about the fact that there is a kind of a small minority of Orthodox men who are promoting a kind of misogyny in the church. That is happening. At the same time that we see this push for the female diaconate, there are men who are saying that uh, women should not teach at all because they're, most of them are converts and they're coming from kind of a super conservative Protestant background. And they assume that that's orthodox. And they say, well, St. Paul said, you know, women can't teach or anything like that. So they don't, they're ignorant about the history of the church. So I'm talking a lot to priests and I'm trying to encourage them to talk to men in their parish to understand that that is not orthodox. So it's they're not going to listen to me. So I can, they don't even talk to me anyhow, but even if they did, they would dismiss anything I had to say. So my point is that we, this is very harmful to women. It's very hurtful. And those of us uh, as women, I don't think there's a woman alive who hasn't experienced the kind of certain put downs from men. This is something that, that we've all been through or men saying something very disrespectful to you as a woman. And I understand that men don't get that, but because we understand that as women and men have never experienced the degradation of their sex, 
I have experienced the degradation of my sex. The fact that I cannot do this, or people say, you can't go there, you can't do this, you can't touch that. Why are you doing this? You're a woman. Somehow you're going to taint whatever it is that you touch. Honestly, I, you know, it's pretty ri ridiculous, the ideas that some men have. They will never understand how that feels to us. So I understand when women want to talk to another woman, but that doesn't mean that she has a special grace or a special gift that a man does not have. A kind, sympathetic man will be able to talk to her in the same way. So I reject the idea, because when we say gifts in the church, we don't mean the ability to sympathize. You know, do you understand what I'm trying to say? A gift is a, is a charism, is a grace of the Holy Spirit. Now, there was a priest once, a, a professor of mine, who's a Catholic priest, who used to like to refer to the Holy Spirit as she. And I used to hear him talk about she and she and she. And I got, after a while, on one of our breaks and during class, I said, Father, why do you call the Holy Spirit she? It's an it. Doesn't have gender. But if anything, you know, it's, it's an it. It's not a she. And he was totally shy. I said, listen, that's you're saying that as a concession to the feminists. And he laughed and said, yes, that's true. Okay, so sometimes people are saying things because it sounds good. We want to acknowledge women's gifts. There's nothing special about women's gifts. If a woman is loving and patient and, and caring and kind, that's not unique to women. Do you, do you understand what I'm trying to say? I think that I do. And I, I, I just find it so interesting that you're saying this because I just hear so much in the discourse right now, often with people who are very much against ordination, that women have certain gifts that men don't have. That seems to be very prevalent oh, in our forms and things. And so- I don't agree. Um, well, well yeah, perhaps I mean, Stevie, it's along the lines of women conceive and bear children, care well, and bear children. That's not know? a gift, that's and, a biological function. Yeah, I, I mean, I well, think that- Well, the St. John Chrysostom did say at one point, Dr. The greatest priesthood is motherhood. Well, sure, of course, because without, which is, you know, we're not going to talk about the male priesthood tonight, but that's one reason why we have men as priests and not women, because women are needed to shape the children in that way, to, to, to raise them. But so I'm just wondering if the, the things that Stevie's hearing are something along those lines, that there's I, a very unique um, abilities, unique um yeah i wouldn't I, I i agree with you the charism doesn't wouldn't wouldn't yes. be the right way to, to speak of it well they but might be saying are, it father we, to sort of pacify women who want an ordained position to say you have something unique and you have what you have and we won't have what we have but not all men are called to the priesthood so you can't say that there's a special charism for you know right. Only men to be priests. You see what I mean? That, you know, and, and that almost opens up the door to the male priesthood, but I don't think we're going to go there tonight. No, we're Maybe not. another time. Marcy, you have a question. Marcy. Hi, Did Father. I don't... Um, yeah, so my question was, um, Doctor, you had talked about uh, when you were growing up that there weren't female chanters in the church there mm -hmm. weren't choir directors you may have even lumped well, Sunday there as yeah, well but you said in any, any of those roles um but at the same time you talked about a lot of the built-in sexism um mm -hmm. from protestant groups um my my question is was that a slippery slope at that point as well? Like what led to that? I'm just wondering the history of- What led to what led to women getting involved in the Orthodox church in those positions? What led, led to, to the- Go ahead. In your lifetime, what led to that changing from, yeah. from men- Yeah, okay. <clears throat> yeah. Not word, but like men- um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. The church and, and, and now women are fulfilling those roles. What changed there? And do you think that that is kind of like a modern day invention, innovation, take on the, the Bible? Um, 
that wasn't there for 2000 years or, or almost. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I, I hear what you're saying. Um, all right. What, well, let's start with what the Bible allowed and what we knew existed in the early church. Um, we talked about this last, last time. We know that in the early church, women did virtually everything except they were never presbyters and bishops. So that means that women can do everything in the church, including teaching. They were even baptizing. I mean, these famous women, Baptists, catechists, teachers, chanters, healers, prophets. They did all of those things. So in the orthodoxy, we follow the tradition of the church. Now, at what point, the women never stopped, completely stopped doing those things, but definitely it diminished from the, we could say, first couple centuries that was primarily because women were needed at home. You have to remember that in taking care of a home was more than a full-time job. That is, she had to keep the fire going, she had to grow her vegetables, she had to make the clothes of the children. She had to have the children and feed them. And good. I mean, this is women simply were not able to get away from that reality until very recently, very, very recently. The, the life of our great grandmothers was nothing like our lives because we have electricity and refrigerators and freezers and drive through whatever and um, machines that wash our clothes and dry our clothes, if that had not happened, women could not go on to college. You, you understand what I'm trying to say? We forget that our life as modern women is very different from all the generations that came before us. And this is what has allowed us the luxury to be able to study, to go to school longer, to enter the workforce, and still have a family. Prior to that, it was impossible. That, that's just the reality. So it's not that the women are suddenly doing things that they never did in the church, but that they time and education is allowing them to do what they were not able to do because of the reality of having to stay home. And because women who were unmarried, like nuns, were always doing those things in the church. Do you understand what I'm saying? My, uh, they didn't have a, a lot. They didn't have the, but now married women. So now it's visible. So to, in order to chant, for example, you have to know what you're doing. You have to have someone teach you. Well, when I, my husband taught me before there was an internet and tapes and things like that. Now you can go on the internet and learn how to chant. Before you had to go to school or you had to have somebody to teach you. And that wasn't, it just wasn't accessible. You today, today, a woman can go study theology. It's not that they were forbidden before. They just didn't have the opportunity before, uh, unless they were a nun. Do you see what I mean? Well, one, one quick example. My mother's a pediatrician, but um, when she told her parents that that's what she wanted to study, um, they were not going to pay for her education. They, they, they basically tried in any way to to keep her. And she said, I'm, I'm still going to medical school. Anyways, women's medical wow. in Philadelphia, that's what it was called. She was amongst a, a first, you know, a first uh, whole group of women that were going into, into wow. med medicine, you know, in the 1950s uh, and early 60s. Very unusual. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's not that, that long ago. You're right. That's so, right. So Sula's had her hand up for a long time, but so, uh, Mary, also, Mary Dialectus, Mary, you're going to be after Sula. Go ahead, Sula. Hi, uh, hi, Dr. Um, Constantino. Hello. Um, I, I missed last week's session, but I did listen to it. But I just want to put, ask you just in a nutshell, so I'm clear on this, because it sounds like women had a lot to do with the early church. Women were, um, I mean, Christ himself, included mm -hmm. women in his entourage and they That's had right. specific roles. That's right. But I guess I remember someone telling me, maybe it was my Sunday school director when I was a child um, in my old church, that the reason why we don't have female priests is because Christ is a male. He it's it has to do with his, him being a man. Um, is that... <clears throat> Some people say that, but that's mostly a Catholic argument, to tell you the truth. 
So um, that that when uh, the priest stands in front of the congregation, he's modeling Christ, and he actually stands in persona Christi, which means that he's standing. He's the person of Christ right now, doing the sacrifice. Some Orthodox theologians say that, but the main reason, well, I think the what I would say is that women are, are not priests is because Christ did not choose one of the apostles to be a woman. And the church knew and Christ knew, and this is just my, listen, this is just my opinion. You're never going to find this. All we know is this is what Christ set up. And so that's what we follow as Orthodox Christians. Having lived with a priest all these years, 40, 44 years, I can tell you that it is not something that could have been done by women, because of the realities of what I'm talking about. So even today, women, well, they could say, well, I could have a baby and leave it with a babysitter and go to church or go to the hospital if I'm called to do as a priest. That didn't exist as a possibility. There was no infant formula. There was no way to take care of a home. So a woman would, would end up neglecting her family if she were a priest. Because only women can have children and then nurse children and take care of them. And it would create a problem for the family. I personally believe that that is the reason. And the second reason might be what Father mentioned. We're just too, we're just, we would just take over. We would take over <laughs> everything in the church. And I got to tell you, there's a lot of truth to that. And, um, this is what has happened to these other churches where women have become priests. Men have left. Men want to feel like they're a part of something, not that they have to be over women or something, but women tend to dominate. Look, we do in the home. I appreciate what you said, Father, because I have to remember, because my husband often feels that I'm critical of him because he doesn't do things properly <laughs> at home. Okay. I, I but, don't think he's the only husband, but yeah, I do okay. thank you for saying that. I'll, I'll never forget. <laughs> I, he, I had him dress our son to come to my graduation at Harvard, and he dressed my son in his pajamas. <laughs> and I said, honey, this is his pajamas. Don't you recognize his pajamas? <laughs> I could, I mean, I've got to tell you something. Oh, well. So, you know, sorry, but this is the this is the reality. So we women are can be extremely look, we take we just take over. We just do. Uh, <laughs> and so this then. is what I've seen in, in Episcopal Divinity School and other divinity schools that have had women. Women just dominate. And then men just recede. Women are like this, like I'm talking to you now, men just shut up and pull back. They don't want that. Father, is there, is there truth to what I'm saying? Yeah, no, no. I, I, I definitely think that if women entered into the altar, like if we started with women altar girls in the altar, and it's I've already seen it in the churches that have begun to introduce women altar girls, the boys yep. are just disappearing. In boys don't want to come. Yeah. Um, so... Um, it's, you know, just, we can go into this a lot more in depth, Sula, and I may be inviting Dr. Mary and David Ford, who wrote a paper, a 35-page paper, addressing some of the, the issues having to do with women diaconate and, and women priesthood. So we might do that a little bit later on, uh, maybe okay. even in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, we've got a little bit off in. topic. We said we weren't going to talk about that, but... We're a little Go bit ahead, over, but, but Mary, you've you've waited very patiently to ask your question, so maybe we'll let your Mary. question be the last. I just have a quick one. Thank you so much, Doctor, for Hi, Mary. doing this, and it, and thank you, Father, for sponsoring this. Um, I watched the first two sessions. I took copious notes. I was very interested in it. Um, uh, I'd just been come back from the national convention in California, and uh, I know they had a speaker on this as well, yep. which I didn't get to see because I was in the Philoptos stuff, but I watched it later online. But I, I just was thinking when we were talking about mm -hmm. over time how women, you know, like father's mother became a you know, pediatrician, how women have grown yes. in the church. What would happen, do you think, it's just kind of hypothetical, if Jesus would come today yeah, and we weren't talking about how it was for women back then, but he'd come today and he'd be getting his apostles and, and women are all pretty much, you know, equal in our yeah. society. Now we can have the career and family. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think it would be different 
in that case you know maybe we're just looking yes. at it because we're so used to it being from it, yes. but if if they would come today when we're more equalized um I don't know. I'm just thinking, I know you said it takes time to change the church. I don't think we're talking about changing big T tradition here. I, I, but go on. Like, that was just my question. I'm just mulling it over in my mind. Like what would happen if this was starting today rather than, you know, yeah, would she, what, Jesus thousands of I, years I, ago. Yeah. I, I think, no, I, I think then. So again, you're, I'm speculating about the mind of Christ, but I'm telling you from what I have seen in the ministry of the clergy, the, priest is on call 24 7 and it's not that fathers aren't important in the home but mothers are critical in the home so if women would it would affect the home for the for the mom to be gone so much do you see, see what i, think I mean that's where i'm I, I see what you're saying and i get that but i think i'm looking at it that I don't necessarily agree a hundred percent because I've seen like my neighbor down the street was like a Mr. Mom. The yeah. wife was the, okay, was the breadwinner. That's, that's true. And, what does that's true. That, and that's my true. daughter is a pediatrician now herself and she would yes. love to have children. And, if, and someday if she does, yes, she'll have to need help taking care mm -hmm. of the child, but I don't think that's, that's right. going to make her a bad mom or a bad no, family. I, I don't think so necessarily, but the, the, the life of the priest is is really unique and I, I only came to this conclusion from what I saw with a number of middle of the night calls to hospitals with a number of families that need attention you can't be worried about your own family you have but to I mean wouldn't you to think in person. today's world the husband should pitch in then a little bit why is it yeah, all on the woman right, that's all I'm saying he um, would have to be a Mr. Mom and you know what that's very unnatural for men it is but I, I, I just think that so women began, can do everything. So I, well, that's, that's I just agree. my view. I, I, I agree with you, but I'm mean, we're again just speculating. Would Jesus right. have done it? Can we I just talk that... about the altar girls though too? Um, because okay, Father, ahead. like I would like to know what the archdiocese does think about this because uh -huh. Archbishop El Pidoforos had little girls as his He's acolytes. Promoting it. So is the church nationally trying to promote this and and like i would like to know their stand on it is what i'm my other question yeah uh, well yeah. well I, I i can't speak for the archbishop um and i can say that there's nothing there's no directives that have come in right. any way from from the archdiocese certainly not from our metropolitan i know um that um, there is a, there's a church within the archdiocese and district, at least one, that did introduce altar girls, though they were not going into the altar, but they were still caring. And there's a church in the metropolis of Chicago, and I know the Metropolitan of Chicago initiated that in, yes. the, in that parish. So what's happening is that you see certain metropolitans now that are, are wanting in, in, in initiating these types of things. And... and the difficulty with that, as uh, Dr. Constantino was alluding to, is because it's individual people doing things, or, or even just one metropolis, and that creates these issues yes. within the church that, that we we haven't we we haven't come to a consensus about this. He, even in that presentation that happened at the clergy lady, Deacon John Chris of Geese was was basically suggesting perhaps we need to experiment a little bit with this like in the life in in the the life for the church the history of the church have been times when things have begun and then stopped right and so it's almost like they're, they're, they're an exper ex experimentation kind of trying to be to be done and and that he one of his main points was that w we should go into it understanding that we have to always be thinking about everyone not just about an individual person that does this does this serve uh, everyone who's involved in all of this. I, my only response when I heard him say that, I was, I was listening to it, I was just saying, but didn't we already experiment with this? No, we, we, yeah, we know, don't. In, in the history yeah. of the church. Um, but but the, so, but the, I think that that's a great question, Mary, because I think it leads us to understand how we should think as Orthodox. Exactly. And, and actually, Dr. Jeannie wrote a whole mm -hmm. other book called thinking mm -hmm. orthodox and there's That's a lot right. of things in this book that are really very applicable to our discussions and more importantly 
to how we discuss things with with other people. Like I went up to one of the persons who was the panelist um, that day, and we had a wonderful discussion the next day because it wasn't at all antagonistic. Can you right. still hear me? My earpiece is starting to go. It it was it 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 was tr dialogue. I I shared my perspective. I respected the things that she was saying. And and we came to a point where she said, she said, Father, I really appreciate this. What can we do about this? You know, how do how do we go forward from here? And what I said is, I just like to take the panel that that spoke yesterday and to take the faculty at St. Pecan's and the people that I know are that are writing yeah. very much on the side of the issue and put them all together and have to have them have to stay together until they all agree. And then we know the Holy Spirit would have, you know, have spoken and and we we yeah, we'd have, have a, a discussion a yeah. because it comes out of consensus, it comes out of listening, and and that's ultimately the Holy Spirit. You know, if we listen closely enough, is going to direct this as as he has, as she has, as the Holy Spirit has always in the life of the church. When when we begin to make dis decisions on our own, so it's nice to say that we can talk about it. We should be talking about this for a hundred years. But what happened was um, the, the St. Phoebe Center decided they were done talking. And she has said this openly. We're, I'm done talking. We've talked long enough. We're done waiting. We don't want to wait anymore. And we're going to make this happen. Well, that's not the way we do things in the church. That's a recipe for disaster. If we love our church, why do we love our church? Because we have preserved the ancient faith. Once we decide that I don't like this thing and I'm going to change it and this becomes acceptable and we push it through and everybody just has to live with it. Then we have this guy making this change and this woman making this change and this one. There's going to be, you're not, you're going to wake up 20 years from now and you won't recognize your church. That's what happened to the Catholic church. That is exactly what has happened. And they've gone from bad to worse, but they're at least united because they have a Pope. I want us to think very seriously about the fact that we have nothing that unites us as Orthodox Christians except that devotion to preserving apostolic tradition. Sometimes we don't understand the reason for it. Maybe I don't understand or agree with why women can't be priests. I totally get it if a woman thinks women should be priests or men thinks. I mean, I don't, but we don't go ahead and do it just because we think that should change because we do not know why things have been set up the way that they have. We don't know why the church does the things. And what we're supposed to do is behave with humility and say, this is our faith and we're going to preserve it. And if we don't understand why things are done the way they are, we're supposed to try to find out or we're supposed to pray that God enlightens us, not take a, an aggressive stance to change something because we think in our very limited human brain, we think that this is how it should be. Re remember that the church has existed for all of these years. We are living in a very narrow window of time. I've had people tell me, well, how come it's taking so long to do this or that? I said, what do you mean so long? Your lifetime? That's a long time? This is a blink of an eye in the life of the church. We don't get, make changes because we can't foresee the consequences of those changes. That's why the church changes very slowly. And because of that, the church has avoided all of these mistakes and problems that have happened among the Protestants and the Catholics. And if we're smart, we can continue to discuss this, but we don't make drastic changes in the church um over a short period of time because we all we will lose our church and we will just end up in schism there's going to be schism because most of the orthodox will not go along with that and what will happen is that whatever jurisdiction or whatever church goes off and has women deacons or whatever believe me they will eventually have women priests and then they will devolve into all kinds of other aberrations and heresies that is 100 percent guaranteed to happen over time because i've seen it i've seen it in other churches they end up in i mean serious heresy because then they're trying to modernize we're going to modernize this we're going to change this and this and this because it seems like the right thing to do 
according to our human reasoning. Remember, the church follows, does not follow human reasoning. The church does what Christ gave to the apostles. That's it. If we don't always, we don't, we're not in step with the world. And we don't have to be, and that's okay. So those are my thoughts. I'm just as a word of warning, I'm very concerned about that. Once we begin to change, we lose the church. Just think about that. So it's been it's been almost two hours. Um, wonderful discussion. Uh, thank you, everybody, for for your questions and hanging in for this long. And I'm certain we could keep going on and on, yes, Doctor. Yes. And, and we may bring you back again, but I think we need to give you a little bit of a rest. We've been. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Thank you for everybody stick, for sticking with us. For I know it's very late where you are. So um, I, let's let's just finish yes, with um, with uh, the 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 ex apostolatio that are at the end of the paraclete service. Um, oh, where do I have the heaven? Oh, yeah, it, it's very appropriate, I think, uh, for us to sing these hymns to the Mother of God. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think I'm going to just sing two. I'm going to sing the second and the fourth of the of those four uh, ex apostolati at the end of the Paraclesi services that we sing just during this period of time. So we have her her. Uh, overlooking in uh, our conversation and our hearts and that she will um, continue to lead us in the way that she does to her son and to our salvation. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You are the sweetness of ages, the gladness of the afflicted ones. A protection of all Christians, O Virgin Mother of our Lord, grant me now help and save me from the eternal torments. You are a tower adorned with gold. A city surrounded by twelve walls, a shining throne touched by the sun, a royal seat for the king, O oh, unexplainable wonder. How do you? Nurse the master. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that, Father. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank I will you. send out a, a message to see if we're going to continue. Uh, as I said at the very beginning, I think before I started recording, and maybe um, hearing back from Mother Christopher to see if she'd like to speak to our group as well. Um, she gave a wonderful talk on women in at the commencement at St. Ticans, and I, I thought it would be really good for us to hear from her as well. So um, I'll send that to everyone, and everyone have a, have a blessed evening. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Take care.